We've got a Fox News alert. Donald Trump's Muslim travel ban is blocked, so-called, at least for now. A federal judge in Seattle ordered a temporary restraining order against the executive order blocking arrivals from seven countries. The ruling means that for now the order cannot be enforced. Fox News correspondent Dan Springer is live with more on the judge's decision. Dan, what do you know? Yeah, and, and Tucker, this is important because this is a nationwide enforcement, uh, or ba basically a uh, you know an effort to block this enforcement of this uh, Trump executive order across the country. We've seen other challenges, but they are more narrowly tailored. This one is uh, across the country. Judge James Robart uh, giving the Attorney General here in Washington State a full victory by uh, issuing this temporary restraining order, uh, arguing and uh, citing that the state does have standing. The state is being harmed by this executive order order on immigration and that it is likely the state would win on the merits of the case. Um, here is the uh, Attorney General from Washington, Bob Ferguson, reacting after the decision today. Judge Robart's decision, effective immediately, effective now, puts a halt to President Trump's unconstitutional and unlawful executive order. The law is a powerful thing. It has the ability to hold everybody accountable to it, and that includes the President of the United States. So Bob Ferguson says that stops the ban on the uh, refugee program. It stops the 90-day ban on uh, re people coming in from Iran, Iraq, uh, from Libya. And so we don't know what the Trump administration is going to do. Donald Trump did tweet today. Uh, earlier that to quote we must keep evil out of our country but that was in response to a victory that he had in a court in Massachusetts the Department of Homeland Security issued a no comment today but certainly it's likely the Trump administration will file an appeal to try to block this temporary restraining order Tucker Dan Springer thanks a lot well despite today's ruling lawsuits keep piling up against the immigration orders today the ACLU filed a class action lawsuit in the state of California they claim the order is religious discrimination and does not provide constitutional due process to foreign arrivals. We're joined now by Michael Breen, a co-founder of the International Refugee Assistance Project, a party in the ACL's, ACLU's new lawsuit. Michael Breen, thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for having me, Tucker. So the obvious sure. question, just reading from the script, sure. um, the ACLU is saying that it's unconstitutional because it doesn't provide due process to foreigners coming to this country. I don't know if you're a lawyer or not. but I am. Are, You are? Okay, yeah. so are, are foreign nationals do due process under our Constitution? Well, once they're on U.S. soil, they have rights. I mean, that, that's a right. key piece of law. Yes, right, yes. But more importantly, I mean, let's talk about how this case started. I mean, our clients, our two first clients, two Iraqis, both risked their lives working for the United States in Iraq. Right. Uh, they were special immigrant visa holders. That's the program for Iraqis who are targeted by terrorist organizations because they worked with the United States. Yes. So they were vetted. The U.S. government made a determination that, one, their lives were at risk from terrorists because they stood with us. Guys like me, I, I fought in Iraq. Right? right. So they worked with people like me. And two, that they went through about a two-year vetting process and they weren't determined to be security threats. They got on airplanes to come to the U.S. with valid travel documents. They landed and uh, were detained. One guy was placed in handcuffs when he got to this country. Yep. We found out about this and you know, we contacted a large number of lawyers and when we started to find out these cases were happening started to go to airports i was out at dulles international these two guys came into jfk and we had some simple questions like hey can we see our clients what's the law here uh, and i got to tell you my heart goes out to the cops and the, the customs and border patrol guys who are trying to implement this order because the way the white house did this they had no real guidance so they didn't know we couldn't find out what happened to these people and so we filed a writ of habeas corpus which is basically a fundamental right says if the right. government's detain you we want to come see you and well, find out who you but are. See, that's the thing. Look, nothing you say surprises me. I've been detained by foreign governments twice. Yeah, me too. And the bureaucracy is not something you want to get involved with in any country. And I feel for the people you just described. And we could carve out exemptions for them, as we did for the Montagnards after Vietnam. Well, I, I think but the larger start... question and the basis of your lawsuit is a meaningful one, which is that foreign nationals, who, by the way, are not on U.S. soil. I mean, these are people. This is a, your lawsuit seeks to overturn a ban on people who are not yet here. So your lawsuit suggests that people in other countries have a right to our constitutional protection. So does that mean that North Korea could sue us for anti-Korean discrimination? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm no, of course not. Because we, well, of then not. what's the difference? Why would a foreigner in a foreign not. country have a right to due process because under our constitution? Because these people are involved in a legal process that the United States government is interacting with them on that process, right? They, they, once they start to interact with the U.S. government, certain rights attach, and definitely when they get here. So you're talking about, and, and again, this is a difficult question to answer in part, 
because we're talking about a broad category of people. I mean, this may or may not, depending on who you listen to uh, and which website you read from the government right now, apply to green card holders. This may or may not apply to visa holders. Well, they're saying it does not apply to green card holders. Well, but you're right, that wasn't that, clear at the first. Custom and Border yeah, I'm, Patrol I'm website aware. right now, it says something different. Look, and so, there's, there's no defending the chaos around it. But right. again, the basic principles are worth sorting out because this is not going to end now. It's going to continue, and we need to figure out how we view this. So That's right. you're making the case that we need to let in these refugees, not just to repay them for helping us, which I think is a valid argument, but for national security reasons. So why would it help us from a national security perspective to let in refugees from these seven Well, countries? let's be clear. We're not just talking about refugees, but the thing is we're in a fight. And what this executive order we're does... We're not just talking about refugees. Right. But people this executive come order here. bans everybody who wants to come here from seven different countries. Right. 15,000 Iraqi soldiers and Peshmerga fighters have given their lives fighting ISIS, the Islamic State. President Trump's number one national security priority is to defeat the Islamic State. I agree with that, right? The people who are right now, while you and I are talking, doing the house-to-house, -house, nose nose-to-nose, kill-or-die fight against the Islamic State on the ground in places like Mosul. If you've ever been in an urban gunfight, that's no joke, right? These guys are the ones who are taking the fight to ISIL. Right. We just told them and their families, they're not welcome in the United States. General Petraeus testified before the House Armed Services For a Committee. short period of time. No, not at all for a short period of time. I mean, it's a temporary order. I mean, okay, until we sort this whole thing out? I mean, is there No, a, isn't it by definition a, a temporary order, unless I'm misreading yeah, it? Yeah, but he's got the executive power to do what he wants after this. Okay, but... And, and let's talk about the immediate consequences, right? General al is the commander... that's one of seven countries. And I, un I understand your point. We're talking we can about easily, Syria, we can, well, we're, also, we're also talking about Yemen and Somalia and Iran, and, I, and I, countries that we are not directly involved in. And so but I'm, it's a random list of countries. Let's talk well, about that. it's not that. random. It's a, it's it's a pretty list. pretty random. I mean, no, it, it's the list the of countries that the Obama administration deemed dangerous, as you know. It's not an exhaustive list. The comparison not, to the, not not to the 2011 but, no, but Obama, Obama thing is a, is a total canard. You can carve out, fight. anyone who helps the U.S. military abroad, get special consideration. I don't think there's anybody who disagrees this with that. This is kind of my point, Tucker. If you right. start walking down the exception path, all right, so let's carve out well, all why the wouldn't you do that? Okay, so what about the families of all the Iraqi military people who fought with us? Well, I don't know. It kind of depends. Well, sure, but okay, okay. So let's carve out an exception for them. What about the what about the Kurdish uh, Peshmerga fighters in Syria? What but you're that? not asking for what an exemption. About you're what? trying My to stop the whole thing. The way this thing is written, right? And this is what happens when you go you send a couple of political guys into a telephone booth to write national security policy, and you don't talk to your director, okay. national, your secretary of homeland security, retired marine general, who apparently was you found out about this on television. What you get is an order that is so poorly written. So over-inclusive and under-conclusive at the same time that we can talk about amending it, but you're trying yeah, to but amend it. That's not a actually, you, with respect, you're being a little disingenuous because that's not. I don't think you're making an unreasonable case here, but that's not the entirety of the case you are making or have been making. So, uh, last year you you wrote this piece, an interesting piece, saying basically we have a moral obligation to bring in Syrian refugees. I believe we do. I know okay. you don't. I think that's completely. Well, it's not fine. that I don't believe it. It's that no one has adequately explained to me where that moral obligation comes from and how it would help America. So I'm giving you the chance. Yeah, sure. So look, I mean, again, it helps America because one, we're in a fight, and two, we're being asked yes. to lead globally. Uh -huh. against ISIS, against Islamic extremists, right, who are, by the way, celebrating this ban openly, right? ISIS and the Taliban are thrilled about this. And I, I would encourage you to have some more security Wait, guys so on the are you? I mean, have, I've talked to a million security guys, and your opinion is one among many, but the idea that ISIS is going to hate us and act against us now that Trump has issued these orders is They already is hate ludicrous. us. That, no, that's, well, that's not what I'm They already hate us. This is an aid to recruiting, right? Well, this they is, don't seem to have a problem with that already. Yeah, they kind of do. I mean, if you've got 15,000 Iraqis who've been willing to die to fight these guys, almost all of whom are Muslim, yeah, they have a recruiting problem. Okay, so you think that they're going to dislike us more because of this. But what about our moral obligation? That's the part not I don't dis, understand. Not just dislike us. They will get stronger and we will get weaker. I mean, when you tell the commander of Iraqi totally counterterrorism... No, it isn't. I mean, we just told the commander of Iraqi... General al the commander of Iraqi counterterrorism forces, his kids are living in the United States right now because right. they're under terrorist threat. He's in Iraq fighting. Under the CEO, according to General Petraeus, who knows what he's talking about, General Katani's not allowed to come see his kids. Okay. For I mean, a I'm a dad for, for a 90 temporary. days, okay, look. but you're going to ask this guy to carry the fight against our biggest enemy and tell him, oh, for 90 days, don't come see your kids? I'm a dad. You're a dad. Come on. You wouldn't stand for that. Yeah. That's not hurt feelings. That's you not know, like safe governments space do on things campus. like this all the time. No, they really but don't. That, but you're not answering. Again, this is why I'm accusing you of being disingenuous, because it doesn't answer the question. Why does the United States have a moral obligation to let people from Somalia come here? And I'm not against people from Somalia, but you haven't made an affirmative case for why that's good for our country. I you're, you're talking about Iraq and the families of the people who are yeah. fighting on our behalf. And I think that's a fine case. I don't know if I agree, but it's not stupid. But Somalia or okay, Yemen. Thank you so much. No, I'm serious. Like, <laughs> what? No, but like, let's, this is okay, about seven right, countries. Right, what about the others? This. Let's do this. Somalia or Yemen. Look, we're facing the largest refugee crisis in the world since World War II. Our allies are under strain in Europe. 
Our allies are in a strand in NATO. Our allies are stranded around the world. America has a traditional role to step up and lead in a crisis like that. It's very hard to lead in a crisis when you say, you know what, we want everybody else to do the work. We're not going to pitch in here. I mean, you're, you're but, undermining but American moral true. leadership that's in this not situation. That's true. Of you can pitch true. in in many, in a countless of number true. of ways without inviting the people to come live in your country in public expense. We're talking about a tiny percentage of people. And okay, by the then, way, like, then how there's, many? A, there's a lot of stuff uh, here how, that says, I mean, how, how many, many refugees? Take in, what, 10,000 Syrian refugees? But how many should we take in? At what point will we have done our duty? I mean, that's a, duty is a very loaded word here. How many should we let in? I mean, I would argue for, for a pretty large number of people. You like, would argue for fewer. I don't know what I would argue. I'm asking you. You do it for a living. Well, how many refugees should we I mean, I think given the in? current vetting process and what it can take, you could do about 100,000 people, maybe 200,000. Per year? Yeah. I think that's reasonable. But and you, know you would do that to help those countries or to help our I mean, look, here's the point. We could get virtually anyone in the world to come here who wanted to come. Why wouldn't you say, let's figure out the people who will help America? I'm Maybe not we so need sure that's software. true anymore. I mean, let's, we, <laughs> really? can get a, I, we can get the top talent in the world except for anybody from these seven countries. Are, are you arguing that letting in 100,000 refugees from Syria or any of these countries would be to the economic benefit of the United States, to the moral benefit? Like, what is the point? That's all I'm asking. What is the what's point? The, what's exactly? the point? You're taking yeah, in to, people who so are... So people you can feel good about yourself? Or like, no, what it's is not it? so I can feel good about myself. Then why? Of course not. No, in the, in the face of the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War, the United right. States has a leadership role to play. And by the way, but let's why? not talk about these people like they're total social burdens. I mean, Henry Kissinger came here as a refugee. Albert Einstein came here as a refugee. Are you making? Are you? I just want to know what you're saying. Are you saying that if we let in a hundred thousand refugees per year, it will help the U.S. economy? It will assuage our guilt? I mean, like, what it's not is about the assuaging. point? It was okay, then what is it about? It will ultimately, I think, help the U.S. economy. At very least, it's cost neutral. There's a lot of information you out there. You think it's cost that. neutral? Yeah, I do. In the long run, I think it's cost How neutral. How long will it take to become cost neutral? I have neutral? absolutely no idea. So it's a guess? It's not a guess. It's well, an estimate. I mean, look, like, do you know? No, but I, I have some sense of what the costs are, and they're high. <laughs> they're high. I mean, so, so you have to give a kind of countervailing explanation for why we'd want to do this. And no one ever does other than to say, well, you know, it's our role I to lead in that. the world. Oh, that's, come on. That's a, that's a complete, you're, you're building up a strong man and burning it down. You know that. No, I'm, I'm actually I mean, not. I'm asking, a, and I really am asking a sincere question. I've asked it night after night. Why would we do this? Well, because we have an obligation to do this because the Statue of Liberty tells like, I'm not, us to I'm do not it. sitting here moralizing about the Statue of Liberty. I think this is in our strategic interest. We are fighting extremists who are telling everybody in the Middle East, ISIS has a simple message. You have two choices, right? You average Muslim person in the Middle East have two choices. You can live under our rule and fight with us against America, or right. we'll kill you. And what I'm saying is the United States can offer a third choice. Which is come here? Which is stand with the United States. And it sends a hell of a message to and people. And in exchange, you if get you're to gonna, come here no, and go not, to our public schools? Of course schools? not. But to say okay. none of you can come here, to say, and we're not just talking about refugees. I mean, you're making this a very narrow argument. No, I'm not. Refugees. I'm actually talking we about just, immigration. We just yeah. banned immigration from seven yes, entire right. countries, two of whom are the front lines in this fight. We just told everybody who's standing with us, you know what? We'll let you go kill and die in Mosul. We'll give you the bullets to do it. We'll send our special forces guys to go back you up. By the way, that's, there's some tough conversations happening between friends of mine who are yeah. embedded with Iraqi forces and the Iraqis they're working with right now. Because their expectation was to move here after. No, because, I mean, come on. Well, what do you mean? We well, come on. You just said that. So the tough conversations, no, no, I'm sorry, you don't no, get to move put, the United no, States put, at the end? Of like, course what's the tough not. No, it's, it's why don't you trust us enough to say, why don't you believe that any of us could potentially come here or visit your country on a student visa or anything else? And, oh, by the way, why are you helping ISIS? General Hurtling, my old, I'm well, serious. I, I just, Get General I Hurtling, I, my old division commander in I don't Iraq. Take the, I, I, he's he's respect, getting I just, phone calls. I'm, I'm sure Have he is. In. He's getting phone calls I'm from sure Iraqi colonels and generals. Say. And they're on the phone saying, why are you helping the enemy we are fighting together? Get, get the, have, have my buddy Mark, Matt Olson. Yeah. Okay, he used so, to run the National Counterterrorism So I assume, I assume that if, if, if unfortunately, I'm being told we're out of time, if this order, though, if you're successful in your lawsuit, that ISIS recruiting will slow. I think some damage has been done, but yeah, we can patch it up. I'm serious. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. Mr. Green, thanks all for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it.